I'd like to uh, welcome you all to our webinar today, which is discussing a really important topic in collaboration with the Young Arab Leaders um, under the Arab Women in Leadership series and entitled Entrepreneurship and EdTech, A Global Paradigm Shift. We have two amazing speakers, which I'm going to present very soon. Uh, but before I do that, I just have a few words to share about uh, the Young Arab Leaders. Uh, on behalf of Nabra Al Busaidi, the executive director of the Young Arab Leaders, uh, the YAL is obviously a nonprofit organization that was founded during the World Economic Forum in 2004 under the patronage of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President and Prime Minister of the UAE, ruler of Dubai, and it seeks to leverage the capabilities and expertise of its strong regional network of members to catalyze entrepreneurial and professional development of the next generation of leaders. As for uh, She is Arab, we are a speaker's platform dedicated to addressing the issue of underrepresentation of Arab women in business leadership and at speaking events. And we're very lucky to have two speakers today who are one of our, two of our biggest supporters actually from the launch of She's Arab. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I just want to say a few words about the topic and why it has come uh, risen to the surface more during the pandemic now. Uh, it's obviously a new era when it comes to the education sector. Uh, how can we prepare students for an edtech based world that hasn't fully integrated in the system yet? So edtech is no longer a nice to have. It is a necessity and there's no going back. It's not optional anymore to have like uh, technology or a few online resources as part of the learning system. It's an integral part of the process. And obviously due to COVID-19, 90% of students, if not more around the world have been affected by uh, school closures and digitization accordingly happened at an unprecedented rate countries were not prepared for it and uh, across the Arab region countries uh, responded differently depending on their digital infrastructure, on their uh, public policy readiness and flexibility to change and adapt. So today we're going to hear from two uh, speakers. We're going to hear from Dina Sharif. Dina is the executive director of the Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship at MIT. She's also a senior lecturer at the Sloan School of Management and has over 20 years of international and regional experience in areas like integrated sustainable development, corporate sustainability management, youth civic engagement, strategic philanthropy, and youth unemployment and women's economic inclusion. Dina is particularly interested in the role of the private sector in sustainable development, and she is herself a social uh, entrepreneur and an advocate for conscious capitalism, having founded uh, Ahead of the Curve. Uh, she was also the first Arab to be recognized by the United Nations for her pioneering work in this domain. She, is, uh, she has recently uh, partnered in Disrupt Tech, which is the first ever fintech fund focused on the Egyptian market. Um, Dina obviously is award-winning and uh, is a senior advisor to multiple organizations such as Ashoka. She helped establish the John Gerhardt Center for, uh, for Philanthropy and Civic Engagement at the American University in Cairo. And she's the lead author of several publications and key reports. And last but not least, she's a, a, a person of a uh, dear friend uh, from university days. So Dina, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. And thank you for being a big supporter of She's Arab. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you. And the next speaker is Helen al Ozezi. Helen is a Young Arab Leaders uh, member, and she's also one of our biggest supporters at She is Arab, so I thank her for that as well. She is the CEO of BizWorld UAE, a social enterprise teaching children entrepreneurship skills. She's the director of the Center of Excellence at, uh, for Entrepreneurship at GEMS uh, World Academy. 
and she is also the founder of Future Entrepreneurs, a platform to empower youth entrepreneurs in the MENA region. She specializes in marketing, nonprofit management, and entrepreneurship. She has served on multiple NGOs boards as member or ambassador, advisor, fundraiser. Um, she was also uh, multiple award winning. She has been awarded uh, one of the 50 most influential women in the Arab world by Arabian business. She has also been recognized as one of the UAE's smartest uh, one 100 people by Arabian business. And on a personal level, uh, she is a mother of two girls. She's a triathlete. I don't know how she finds the time to do this. And an adventurer. She believes in making dreams come to life and that anything is possible. Uh, thank you so much, Helen, for being with us today. Thank you. For I just me. want to, it's a pleasure. Thank you for being here. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, we will go through a fireside chat between our two experts, um, which I believe will be very interesting because they will uh, they will need no moderator. They will moderate their own conversation. Uh, I will just interject when it comes to Q&A. So I'd like to flag that you can use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen for sharing questions anytime throughout the conversation. Um, and uh, after hearing them, we will have 15 minutes dedicated to Q&A as well. So uh, I'll stop at that and I'll move on to Dina to uh, start. Ah, thank you, Samar. Uh, I have to say, I'm just looking at the list of uh, participants and there's so many people I know. <laughs> so excited to see your names, Delilah, Nohefni, Rimarto, Rudaina, all these people that I never get to see face to face, but it's always nice to see your names in these webinars. So um, thanks so much for organizing this extremely important topic. And uh, Helen and I kind of decided to do this a little bit unorthodox. And I, I suspect our, our choice to be a little unorthodox in how we do this is probably due to our belief that education also needs to move into a space of being rather unorthodox as opposed to what it is today. So I wanted to start off the conversation, um, Helen, with asking you a question. You, you've pursued a career uh, in education, in transforming education in our region. And you and I both know that education in our region is not without its challenges um, and problems. And we could create a long list of, of issues that face us when it comes to education in the Middle East. But yet you continue to work in this, sec this sector. Um, what was it that, that motivated you to choose a career path in education? And what made you focus specifically on entrepreneurship education as a pathway to improving education in our region? Well, like you said, I think um, you know, education really, really is lagging. And I think even more so in this part of the world, in the MENA region. And um, I have the firm belief that education can make the world a better place. I think education is the core foundation for everything. Take any problem today. And if you go back to the basic foundation, if kids and youth and you know, people growing up had a good education, chances are a lot of these problems wouldn't exist today. So I really believe in the power of education. I think every child has the right to a good education. And by education, I don't necessarily always mean like the traditional classroom and the way that it's seen today in terms of like those desks, especially now that schools are opening up and we've, we've gone back to the individual desks with a chair for social distancing purposes. I think taking all of that and putting that aside, education is all about like experience and skills and the entrepreneurial mindset. And that's where the entrepreneurship part comes in. I think um, a lot of it isn't necessarily about entrepreneurship and setting up businesses. It's about the entrepreneurial mindset. And the reason why I think that's critical is because if you look at all the numbers today, you have 30% youth unemployment rates. I don't know if it's gone, it's probably gone up since the last, uh, the last set of data. And if you look at the unemployed, 30% of them are actually university graduates. And so clearly the world is not, the education sector is not preparing the youth for the world that they're entering and going into. So 
I think um, having the entrepreneurial mindset, which is things like creativity, grit, resilience, and being able to be innovative and thinking outside of the box, I think all of those skills are necessary because the, the children that are graduating out of schools are going to go into jobs that don't exist today. And so we can't actually prepare them for the jobs that exist tomorrow. And if you have that entrepreneurial mindset and you're able to instill that from a very young age, which is why I start at the age of like seven or eight even, um, I think when you start at a very young age, instilling those kind of skills, that is a good path to the kind of education that will prepare them for the future. And if I'm going to take this backwards, I mean, you're asking me about why I chose entrepreneurship and education. I mean, you focus on youth in the Arab region. And how does that tie into your focus with entrepreneurship as a is a vehicle for sustainable growth. I mean, I'm sitting here talking about, you know, entrepreneurship education for young kids, and then there you are, and you've actually dedicated your life to youth and entrepreneurship. So just like I chose it, why did you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, yesterday I was uh, I was with my siblings. Uh, I'm actually on 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 vacation and. Uh, my, my older brother was saying, you know, when I go out on the street, in the streets of Egypt now, I never see anybody my age. And, and I said, of course. And he said, why would you say, of course? I said, because over 60% of our population is under this, under the age of 34. And that's the case for the entire Arab region. Um, I think it would be really strange if we did not focus on youth in all the work that we do, considering uh, the demographics of, of the Arab region. But I think for me, why I choose entrepreneurship, and, and it wasn't my entire career. I came, I came into entrepreneurship about a decade ago, and I think it was more working in sustainable development. It, it, it's a hard, it's a hard field to work in, and oftentimes you find yourself losing hope, um, hope that all of this donor-driven aid is actually creating impact, hope that public policy is actually creating the kind of inclusive growth that we need. You find yourself wondering, is all of this working? Um, I, I think for me, entrepreneurship is this great space of hope and creativity and new. Um, it, it represents this notion of possibility. And it also, for me, it's extremely empowering. So for, for, for me to talk about entrepreneurship and to, through either ahead of the curve or through the Legatum Center at MIT, work with young people to help them start innovation-led businesses that that can solve some of the biggest problems that our countries face. For me, that gives agency back to youth and doesn't, it's not that they're a problem, but rather they are part of the solution. And it also represents a lot of hope about what can come in the future. So that, that's, that's why I do it. And, and um, to someone's point earlier, for me, uh, when I teach entrepreneurship, I, I don't, unlike you, I don't work at the school level, but I do work at the university level. And when I teach entrepreneurship and I use very much an entrepreneurial pedagogy, um, it's not about teaching entrepreneurship and, you know, you and I exchange messages about this. It's about teaching an entrepreneurial mindset and teaching certain skill sets like empathy, um, like design, like research, uh, problem solving. And I, I think what I've seen with students is that when you teach them how to see a problem and understand that problem and turn that problem in, into an opportunity that they can actually design a business model around, that there's so much power in that, in the sense that they feel that they, ha they can make a difference, that they can design a business that could work. Um, and for those who don't, really want to start a business or necessarily be an entrepreneur to take that mindset into whatever job they have has enormous potential. And, you know, I think, I think that while we both talk about entrepreneurship education, I just, I want to throw back a follow up question to you. I think there are a lot of us and I, not a lot of us, I would say actually there's a small group of us who really talk about education and entrepreneurship education and disrupting the way we think about education and how we teach in the pedagogy and education. Why are we not seeing the scale? Yeah, um, I think there's, so I'm going to do, I'm going to say something that might be a little bit uh, politically incorrect. So a lot of uh, the challenges, I mean, I work within a school as well, you know, and I, I never really realized this until I was based in a school. 
And I'm very fortunate in that the school and the system that I'm a part of is actually probably one of the best. It's IB. It's like, it's the, you know, the best of the best. And the teachers that are teaching it are the best of the best. And still educators are very kind of attached to their old ways. So there's a lot of that that comes into it as well. I mean, we talk about, you know, let's do this and let's innovate here and let's try this. But educators are also kind of very used to doing things a certain way. And so that's why a lot of it doesn't change overnight. There's, there, there's like education on different levels, education on the government level, on the school kind of management level, on the school operator level, on the educators level, the parents, etc. So there's like a lot of people that need to be involved in the change. And that's the, they, these are kind of the challenges that we see every day. I mean, we try to do something different, try to do something new, and then you find there's a lot of resistance to change. And things that have worked for a long time, people don't necessarily see the value in changing because the change is actually for something that's so far ahead in the future that they don't even see it. They don't recognize the world that's going to be waiting for their children. I mean, I think this, the number is in every first grade classroom, 60% of the kids will be in jobs that don't exist today. I think 60 or 65%. And, but that's such a foreign concept to so many people that they don't even want to think about it. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons why things don't take on as fast. Well, and as we're in that moment now. It's, yeah. it's what we're seeing right now is overnight, a complete virtualization, not just of education as a sector, but so many other changes have happened as a result of COVID-19. Um, yeah. I was in school today, uh, just to, you know, I was in the school today and there was, I was walking through the corridors and we have, uh, in the classes, we used to have really modern, future kind of centric classroom setups with bean bags and group tables and stuff. And now it's all gone back to the kind of individual chair and table and distance. But then they've also taken away all of the papers and the crayons and the colors for the younger kids where everything's going to be digital. It's completely a different world. And it's neither the old one nor the one we were in pre-COVID. And um, it's going to be very interesting to see how that goes. So, so Helen, let me just ask you one more question for, for the okay. people listening. Um, you've been working in education for a very long time. What are, what are some of the most uh, significant challenges we're seeing in K-12 education today? I would say the, the fact that there's a lot, of, um, a lot of stuff, that a lot of the education is still very old school. So even though you have something like IB, then you have the government mandate things like, you know, social studies, but it's all very, very much old school, traditional. So I think there's, there has been a shift uh, between kind of what's expected for the new kind of education versus what governments still in, you know, enforce and still require. And you can't go ahead and say, okay, we're going to ignore government requirements because otherwise they won't get the certifications and they won't get into, you know, uh, get into universities. But I'm going to just ask you something because at the end of the day, we're talking about change and challenges, right? And someone's going to have to take the lead. And I would love to know about who you think should be taking this lead. You know, is it the government? Is it civil society? Is it the private sector? Who is it? Who do you think should take lead? I think everyone should be leading. I, I think you made it a, a point when you first started that education is kind of the base. It, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, education defines a lot of who we are. I, I oftentimes walk in, oh, where did you go to school? Or where were you, where did you go to university? It's very much a part of what allows us to become who we are, right? And I think that education for me is, while it's lacking many, many things, it's not something we can do without. It's something that we need to uh, bring into the needs of today and we need to see it transform, not just to meet the, the job market, right? I think, I think for me, the problem is um, whenever we talk about education specifically in the Middle East, we confine our conversations about education to what is going to happen um, when, when sectors transform and we need different skill sets 
how are we going to employ? The question for me is, are we educating our youth and our population in the region to be good people, to be better leaders, to actually allow them to be who they are, to be creative, um, to use art, or to be a scientist, or, you know, I, I always wonder, are we educating people to only go in a very particular direction? Or are we allowing the space for people to evolve in a way that would allow their best talents to come out? Um, so the answer is that I think everyone should be leading the transformation of education and not just for the job market, but because we also are seeing such a dearth of good leadership and we need to be educating our youth to be better citizens, more engaged, better problem solvers. And that's just not happening. And um, what I would add is not just that the private sector, public sector, and civil society need to own this together. And we need to see that intersection of partnership emerge so that we can see a transformation of the sector. Um, and when I say private sector, I also mean entrepreneurship and ed tech and the startups that are starting to emerge in the education space. I also think that the involvement of young people is critical. We don't really ask our students what they want to learn in school. And Helen, I know you're smiling because I, I'm sure you, you say this all the time. We don't ask our students what they want to learn. We don't ask them how they want to learn, right? I, I even at, at university, I don't, we don't walk into a classroom and say, well, how would you like to learn about this topic, right? Um, and I think these are things that we need to start having better conversations about together across the different sectors of public sector, private sector, and civil society, because I think we might get better policies. We might see better businesses emerge, and we might see civil society actually address issues of education in a better way that is more suitable. And I see Samar is here, so I know she wants to throw in some questions, so I'll let her do that. <laughs> Thank you, Dina. No, I think it's it's actually on the same point. It's very relevant. Um, Elema here is asking, what is your opinion on innovation and creation of technology when you think of education today? What skills are missed when we don't tap into creating solutions, building prototypes and coding, or developing platforms or mobile applications? So do you think entrepreneurship is enough? And you've already kind of touched upon that by saying that, you know, there are a lot of skills that we need to teach. Uh, more than you know what we're offering at the moment, such as empathy or other. I'd love to hear Helen's reflections on that question as well. So uh, one of the things that I always try to kind of uh, clarify is when I say entrepreneurship education, I don't mean the whole the idea of entrepreneurs setting up businesses at all. Entrepreneurship to me is about taking an idea and turning it into an action. Or like Dina rightly said, hope, taking something and actually creating something new. So whatever it is, I think it can fall under the entrepreneurial mindset umbrella. And when we talk about entrepreneurial mindset, it's just like we talk about a growth mindset. There are certain skills that entrepreneurship and that mindset instill. Like Dina said, empathy, resilience, grit, negotiation skills. Um, presentation skills from the basic to the not so basic. And I think um, whether we talk about coding or even like, you know, engineering for kids and all these types of different uh, platforms and um, subjects, subject matters, let's say, I think all of them need to be delivered with the entrepreneurial mindset in mind. And I think that's where the, the key differentiator is. I think a lot of, there are a lot of programs out there that talk about entrepreneurship, about starting a business. And I think that that's such a superficial level of the entrepreneurial mindset. There is a lot more to it than just setting up a business. Um, so I hope that answers the question. You know, can I just add something real quick, Samar? Yes, um, please go ahead. You know, I think maybe what, you know, building on what you said, Helen, maybe it, I think the one thing that I've noticed about entrepreneurs that I've worked with is, is the one thing that I've noticed about artists that I know is that they don't fear change. Yeah. They just go, you know, straight into the unknown and they just create the change they want to see. Yeah. And I think that, and I think the, the issue is that maybe even within entrepreneurship education, perhaps what we also need to be teaching not just our students but also our teachers and our policymakers and everyone working in education how to overcome this deep resistance to change that we have because it's really hard to move beyond what we know because when you do that you don't really know what you're going towards 
But that's how learning happens, right? Learning only happens by going into the unknown. And we need to be able to kind of take that leap. And I think there's a lesson to learn from entrepreneurs, but also from artists who always tend to not shy away from moving into a completely unknown space, right? Absolutely. And I think, um, sorry, on that same point, Lama sent a follow up uh, on her question where she's mainly focused on, you know, how do we track behaviors of our children to stay curious and stay motivated to learn? Um, and I think, you know, everything you just mentioned about getting together, be becoming ready to accept change, really, and not just go by the flow and follow a system that has existed for so many years. And on that same note, Tarek is asking, do we need to explore redefining education and asking questions such as, do we need K-12, to maybe eight or nine years could be enough? And why do youth need to spend four or six years in universities? So a lot of questions around the same like notion of accepting change and, and being open to change really. Helen, you had a comment, please go I ahead. I was gonna say one of the things that um, I've been doing with my, within my work is actually working with the teachers. Because I think, uh, like I was saying earlier, there's a lot of resistance to change from all levels. And so when I first started doing the work of entrepreneurship in schools, I used to think that it was all about the kids and I would go in and I'm just like the kids, the kids, the kids. And then I realized that the gatekeepers are the teachers. And that's when I started actually doing professional development for the teachers and getting them and encouraging them to be entrepreneurial in terms of their mindset as well. And that is where a lot of the change and the shift happened. And that's where the shift started and the changes started to happen within the students, but also the teachers. And when you get the buy-in of the teachers and the parents, bringing in the parents as mentors and getting them as part of like the whole system, the system starts to change slowly. It doesn't change quickly, you know, but it's, it can eventually change. Like Dina was saying, the stakeholders are everyone. And I think talking about education and saying it needs to change and expecting the school to overnight transform is really naive on our part. And the parents need to be involved as well as, the, you know, everyone. And I think that's where the, that's where the challenge is. And that's where the difference is. And a lot of parents and um, especially parents aren't that vested in their school, in their kids' schools. So for them, it's just, you know, a, a necessary evil, let's say. So I think there's, it comes at a, it comes at a lot of different levels. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, well, that also, I think, addresses Michelle's question, which says, I couldn't agree more. I'm in Canada and the teachers union, as well as parents, are very resistant to changing how to educate and what to put emphasis on. And she's asking, what are the, some of the things you think we can add or we need to add to the curriculum in K-12? to So I think we've uh, touched upon this more or less. Um, one more question I'd like to address is from Kurt. He said, if education took on some good practices from business, then we would be seriously interested in how our customers are experiencing what we offer as a product. Like why would they buy what we are selling? So the question is, who would you recommend for our sector to collect opinions of young people and how would we respond to what they say? I'm just gonna or say- who, who would you recommend? In the UAE, there, there's a fantastic competition called Didi, which is the design innovation competition. And they work with brands. So last year they worked with Lego, Nike, um, a few other brands, and they got real briefs from the clients and spread, sent them out to the students. And the students came up with innovative ideas to, um, you know, how to increase sales, how to get, you know, product development, all sorts of things. And um, one of our, one of the uh, students that we've been working with actually came as one of the finalists because they have been thinking of different solutions for these different companies. And they went in, they did research in the actual stores and things like that. So that kind of um, merging between the business and the corporate sector and education is so, um, it's so fulfilling for the students. And the companies also say it gives them ideas that they would never have thought of because kids are actually better than us. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to say. So um, these kind of programs and these kind of projects really help uh, bridge that gap. And um, I would recommend that uh, he looks up the DD competition. It's phenomenal. Would you mind repeating the name of the competition again? Design, okay. innovation, and. After I'll get, I'll send it to you, and we can okay. uh, share it. But it's called DD. Um, it's design, innovation, and um, 
Yeah, I, I can't remember the. No worries. So Sa Samar uh, was asking that question, uh, one of the attendees. We'll make sure to include it in a follow up email. And uh, just a follow up note from Kurt, he says that seems to be a key input for scaling. We couldn't agree more. Um, I'll hand over back to Dina because I think she has a question ready for you, Helen. I do. I, I, I think the question I have, Helen, right now is. A lot of people are talking about how COVID-19 is finally going to be the moment where we see uh, a transformation in the education sector. And um, we see a lot of people very happy that finally technology is being embraced as a tool within education. And, you know, at least even here in Egypt, um, you know, many people are very excited that the Ministry of Education has taken on this path of integrating technology within education and so forth and so on. I, I, I remain very skeptical uh, uh, that the, the digitization um, of education is going to lead to good education outcomes. Uh, having said that, I'm not saying that the integration of technology and education is bad. I'm just wondering if it's addressing the right issues. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, is, is COVID-19, is this global pandemic going to take the sector um, and the integration of, is it going to take the sector where we need it to go? And if not, because I feel like you're going to say no, <laughs> what, what, what should we be doing? And what, what would you tell me as somebody who works with entrepreneurs who are interested in education, what should I be telling them to solve for? So I'm going to give you two perspectives. As a mother, uh, my kids had to go from school to online learning overnight. And it was basically their teacher on the other side of the screen. I'm going to have to say our school did a phenomenal job. They were epic, all that great stuff, but it was a teacher on the other side of the screen delivering a lesson. So is this digital learning? No, it's distance learning. It's a little bit different. Now we're moving into this whole blended learning approach where parents are given the opportunity to choose whether they want distance or home learning, etc. There are some tools that are being used and developed, but primarily it's going to be teachers sitting in the front of the class, live streaming, some kids in the class, some kids at home, taking turns. So this, there's no real um, revolutionizing learning you know, happening. I think um, if you got, got into you know, individualized learning through technology, we were speaking earlier about like AI and things like that, and how do you, um, understand students' behaviors through AI and adapt the learning, then yes, I think that would be like a real revolution in digital education. But until that stuff happens, and it's just literally taking the same content and delivering it behind the screen, that's not real digital learning um, per se. Um, but I mean, we can go on about this. And I, I, I'm more curious to see, okay, fine. We're all here, we're all talking about it. And you come from a policy background, right? What role- And my policy. <laughs> my policy background, you know? But I mean, what role can policy play in this? Like who can, we were talking about ownership earlier and we said everyone, but like, I think I have, I, I feel like there needs, to, there needs to be a start somewhere, you know? And I think, um, yeah, you can best answer that. Yeah, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I think public policy is absolutely critical, right? We, without good policy, there's very little that we can do. And I think that, um, I think the Arab region is at, a, at an inflection point. And I think for, for me, on the one hand, I think the, the fact that overnight we had to take um, all of our schools and, and uh, teach virtually, um, what was an interesting moment for governments, right? And I think some of them struggled, some of them were able to move quickly. You know, you're, you're from Jordan. I, I hear Jordan did a great job about uh, with moving and partnering with actual entrepreneurs um, uh, in, a, in a true uh, partnership, um, form of a partnership to, to be able to, to continue to educate its students. But I think if you're gonna, if you ask me what I think policymakers should be doing, I, I think policymakers should be listening. I think it's a moment for them to just stop and observe and completely zoom out and see how have students actually responded to online learning? 
How have teachers responded to online learning? How have parents responded to online learning? And I, and you know, also I'm looking at at the list of participants, and the majority of these participants are women. And I, you know, and I assume that that also means that we need, you know, mothers have a very strong voice in this in talking about how their children have been responding. Like you said, you said the first thing you said is I'm going to respond as a mother. Um, I'm not a mother myself, but I hear my friends who are mothers talk all the time about how they were either happy or disappointed with the experience. But then again, you know, um, I also hear things about how it's very difficult for the working mother to have their children at home learning. There are so many factors involved. I think it's a moment for policymakers to step back and listen to all the varying stakeholders and really hear the voices of those who are in the system the users. So for me, I would take a pure design thinking approach and I would tell policymakers to act like they're an entrepreneur, to take a step back and to collect data, to actually go through a proper exercise of sensing and research and use that to start putting forth policy that will allow for innovation in the sector to emerge. I, I'm not sure that policymakers should dictate um, how the the sector should evolve. I think that that should happen organically and in partnership with um, with the users, with parents, with all the stakeholders that you listed. And I think on I think there's a, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are now interested in education, but I think they also need to stop and listen. So I think what policymakers need to do is to create the space for evolution to happen. They need to provide the tools. They need to allow for technology to be embraced. But then we need to start seeing real problem solvers enter into that space and tackle some of the problems of, well, maybe technology can solve the problem of access, but how is technology going to solve the problem of quality of education in our region? And how are we going to, as people who believe in the incredible power of entrepreneurship education, how are we gonna teach that online? You know, how are we going to um, introduce a lot of the, the pedagogies that we use, games, um, group work, all the things that we use physically in the classroom, in a digital space. I think technology can solve for that. Are we seeing technology solve for that? Not yet. I have yet to see that evolve in the ed tech space. I personally, what I see in ed tech is I see a lot of companies, um, a lot of startups that are uh, coming, coming up that are creating a parallel system, one that is almost identical to the one that exists um, in the physical space. We're, we're seeing them mirror that in the online space. Perhaps what it's a good time now to share that slide, uh, Dina, that we talked about earlier. Um, so we can show the audience the types of edtech startups. This is a slide we found very interesting mm -hmm. from Digital Digest, uh, Menace Digital Digest. So if you can share some reflections on uh, what's available from tools. Yeah, and absolutely. So Menace. what I'm saying, I, I think we're definitely seeing an increase in edtech startups, and this is great. And I think even where I am at MIT, at the Legatum Center, we, I, I'm seeing you know, more people take interest in education. Um, and I think what we're seeing is platforms that will help online education grow and thrive. We're seeing um, actual lectures be digitized and put online so that we don't have to send our students to private lessons. We're seeing a lot of these things emerge um, that are helpful and they're extremely useful tools but I haven't seen anything that really solves the problem of quality. Uh, I think I'm seeing a lot of things that could solve the problem of access. But I think if we don't solve the problem of quality, then we're not really solving the problem of the mismatching skills that everybody talks about. But also, nobody is solving for how will online education solve the problem of how do we graduate students from school who are well-rounded, who have values, who understand what it means to step up and have agency and lead. I'm not sure that we're able to do that yet through digital space. And what I'd love to see emerge within the space of ed tech um, is actual solutions to some of these really significant challenges that we're seeing that education is not yet solving for. 
And Zina, there's one question from Abdul Karim, and since we have this slide up, he's asking if there's any particularly interesting ad tech. Yeah, I know, I know, we want to be like impartial and everything, but just in case you have no, something no, to I share. mean Abdul Karim is a former student of mine, and uh, uh, I hope that one day he he actually moves in and into this space because I do believe that he um, he understands exactly what I'm talking about when I say we need to see businesses design and solve the actual problems in the space that exist. It's hard for me to say that to actually highlight which which startups are um, the ones that stand out for me, because for me, like I said, what I want to see the startups that I want to see are not yet evolving. I think the easy the easiest thing to do was to use technology, and we see this across sectors. We see this in healthcare. We see this in education. We see this in a lot of sectors that we consider. Um, more of the social sectors. We see technology being used for access. And what we need to see is technology being used to actually solve the, act, the problems that exist in the sector. Um, and that is what I hope will be the next phase of ed tech startups, especially now that we've seen what happens when education completely goes online, both at both K to 12, but also higher education. And I say this because I hear faculty within universities across so many of friends of mine who are faculty and so many faculty discussions at MIT, you know, how do we ensure that the same quality is delivered through a screen? You know, how do we make sure that the students get the same experience within uh, through Zoom that they're getting that they would get in our normal classroom? And we haven't yet seen tools evolve to help us do that. And, you know, Helen is smiling and I feel like she's smiling because she wants to say something because that's usually what happens. So <laughs> go ahead, Helen. Oh, I just, I just wanted to, like, you're completely spot on. And there's even a bigger challenge now because of this whole blended learning approach. Because the online thing happened overnight. And then the parents and teachers, everyone went crazy saying, oh, no, this is not education. It's not what we want to do. And the platforms weren't ready. And so it was literally just a kind of taking everything and putting it online. And then the government said, okay, let's do this whole option for blended learning. And now the teachers are going to be sitting in a classroom having to deliver face-to-face -face with parents that have chosen to have their kids at home and still expecting individualized learning and feedback and assessments. And then you have two different teaching methodologies coming in together. And who's going to handle that? Like who's going to be able to do that? You know, I have to try to do this semester. Yeah, like that. But that's the reality, and that's what you know. What you're saying about the platforms are not doing, are not replacing traditional education. They're just adding an extra layer. So when my daughter was getting her online learning, I felt bad for the teachers having to send each and every student individual feedback for each and every assignment and each and every piece of material, right? And now you take that and add on to it another level. And there, there is no one that brings the worlds together and actually kind of makes education seamless and digitalized in a comprehensive way. It's great that you mentioned that, Helen, because you have just answered Tarek's question. Tarek was saying, I wonder whether resistance to change by parents and teachers is partially caused by how actual education systems are designed and also by the related narratives of assessments, certifications, and phases, etc. So I think we have that um, addressed, but I'd like to also address Delilah's question because she had her hand up earlier and please do not use the um, raise your hand option and uh, send your questions through the Q&A window because we won't have time to unmute anyone. Um, so Delilah's asking, how can we ensure that the evolving ed tech effectively accounts for and even leverages cultural and gender differences in learning and access? And we know that this has been a challenge with a lot of the AI driven apps and a lot of the technology that's been evolving over the past few years. So how can we ensure that this takes place? Uh, Dina, would you like to share your reflections on that? Well, Delilah is a very good friend. And uh, my answer to that would be, I hope that she becomes an advocate for addressing gender issues in, in education. Um, you know, on a more serious note, I think that that goes back to, to my previous point about why it's so important that we use this opportunity of what happened with this global pandemic and all of the issues that we came to see very clearly with 
the overnight digitization of education to really understand all of the, the difficult issues that exist within, within the education sector. And what Delilah is talking about is, you know, not just gender differences, but cultural differences. And these are things that we don't talk about. You know, I, I, I think that I always say, uh, when I was teaching at the American University in Cairo, and I think it's even more pronounced here in the, in the Arab region than it is, um, that it is in the United States, it was very difficult for me to get uh, women to raise their hand and ask a question without first saying, I'm sorry. And then also to do group work without handing over the work that they did to a man to give the final presentation. And I, I think these are things however harsh it may sound, and it may sound even more harsh to women like us who have always claimed power from the get-go, this is not the norm. And I think that uh, we need to, my concern is that will we be able to, we already struggle to deal with these gender issues in the class, classroom when we're there in person. How will we deal with that in a, in, a, in a virtual space. These are extremely critical questions to be asking and to be solving for. And I think this is a really good moment um, for everybody to gather all of these wonderful insights um, and use that to start coming up with more innovative solutions to how we can improve education uh, using technology. And, and I, I, again, I believe that we can. I just don't think that we're solving for the right problems because I think in all of our conversations about education, we talk about access. And I know, I know that Rodaina is saying, don't forget that not everyone has access to even to uh, online education. And that is true. But I feel like we can solve that. The other issues are even more complex to solve. Um, giving people access to the digital tools. That is a great policy. That is a great problem that policymakers can solve. And there, there are solutions to that that I feel that if we put, if the political will is there can be overcome. But issues of quality, issues of cultural differences, issues of gender differences, issues of how do we ensure that different learning styles are met virtually through, through a screen. All these things are things we're just not solving for yet and we need to get there. I hope that because of what happened with COVID and that so many young people actually had to experience what it was like to learn through a screen, I hope that we'll be seeing more and more young entrepreneurs coming up with the solutions to the very problems that they suffered from. And, and on, on that same note, actually, Dina, uh, with regards to marginalized communities, a lot of uh, countries actually opted for using the more traditional methods of like using radio or using TV in, you know, in rural areas or areas that had no connectivity. So like you said, there are temp solutions for these issues, but they need obviously um, bigger or massive investments, <laughs> let's say, to actually allow for the uh, digitization or reach. Um, and on that same note, if we can, uh, if Helen, you can reflect on Mazin's question about um, capturing the attention of uh, children who are uh, less than seven years old or even even seven to nine years old. I mean, I'm a mother and I face this challenge right now. How do you deal with that? I mean, you even launched a new platform now to teach entrepreneurship skills to uh, young children virtually. So tell us more about that, please. I think that was definitely a huge challenge that a lot of parents faced. And uh, I think that's why even now with the going back to school, the schools that have put together this blended learning approach have actually said, you know what? kids until grade six, grade five, they're gonna come into school 100%. We're gonna to have to make it work. Because kids, to get kids' attention um, at that age, when their other option is a lot of games, um, it's very difficult. But there are games, so gamifying it and things like that. There are so many really awesome applications that, for example, teach math, like timetable rock stars, you know, and things like that, that people are using and young kids are using and am I an advocate of it? I'm not going to say how I feel about it completely, but I am going to say I wish kids spent less, less time behind screens. But there are gamified tools, you know, and I think um, allowing them to do things in a creative way. And I think this is where the teacher plays a huge role. I think we underestimate the role of the teacher or the person that's delivering the content. And I think 
from again from what I saw with my own kids the really awesome teachers the kids were engaged you know um, even within the school the teachers that came in and were just trying to deliver the same content they were delivering in a classroom the students were not so engaged so I think there's a huge responsibility on how the content is being delivered and um, you know I think gamifying and making it fun is the easy answer um, and how I think there are a million different ways Actually, uh, a comment just came in from uh, Sara. Sara, it's great to see you here, an old uh, school colleague. She says, as an outdoor educator, I feel like this is a great opportunity for outdoor learning and connecting with nature. She hasn't seen much of this. What do you think about this? I'm going to say there was another question there talking about um, what would you do if you were able to build a school from the ground up with no, res with no limitations to resources. I'm going to say I've actually created the concept for my dream school and it's exactly what she's said is saying. It's uh, technology in harmony with nature. And so a lot of it is about how do you kind of reintegrate nature into kids lives because it's so important and it builds so much in terms of creativity and even humility as people like understanding the scope of the world and um, you know there's a lot to be learned from being out, outdoor in nature and some of the biggest lessons I've learned have been in nature so I think that's something that more and more people should do and I know that my I'm using my kids a lot I don't know why but my kids school has actually uh, created outdoor spaces because it's healthier now you know and even so once they go back to school they're hoping that they'll be able to spend more time outdoors because there's less contamination. So I definitely think uh, more outdoor is necessary. And if we go to what is the ideal school from the ground up, I think definitely a lot more nature and a lot more individualized learning in terms of um, there's, there's like um, the Reggio uh, methodology uh, based out of Italy and they have it in the US and stuff like that, where it's all very, very individualized learning. And I think those kind of, um, teaching methods are the way forward. Wonderful. And, and if we can uh, finish uh, Chris's uh, question, actually, he was asking, what is the future role of the school as a physical institution? Dina, can you share your reflections on that? Do you mm -hmm. think it'll still be relevant or are we going to go completely digital? I don't think completely digital is the solution. That's, that's a personal opinion. I think digital, I think digital will become more and more a part of education. 100% digital, I think, yeah, maybe in some cases, but I don't think it necessarily will be the way all of education is taught 100% digital, digital. I'm not an education expert. I just wanna throw that out there. Um, I, I, my concerns around losing a physical space for education are certain, connected to my concerns around how we how we understand humans right you know we are as people we're mind body and soul and uh education for me has always focused on the mind right you you know science math all of these things that were such a huge focus when we were growing up in education you have to be good at math you have to be good at science you have to be good at writing you have to be good at this but you know how we we're, we're, we also have a body and we also think through movement. And movement is extremely critical to how, how well-rounded we are as individuals and our ability to make good decisions. So I think for ev all of education to move online takes us further and further away from the, the need to integrate movement and in nature into our education as Sara said and as Helen said, it's not even just, just being exposed to nature, but actual movement, movement through dance, movement through sports, movement period, um, and how we think through movement. And then I think also the soul, you know, arts is how we feed our souls. And we also think by being creative and by listening to music and by painting or um, drama, theater. There's so many elements in the arts that always tend to be at the bottom of the list when it comes to education and how we think about education. Because when you, whenever you see reports come out about education, you always, they always talk about how well students did in math and science. But then, you know, I, I know incredibly successful people um, and incredible leaders who I admire 
who were neither good at math or science. <laughs> so there's a lot that I think we need to question. And I think we want, if we really want to see our education systems produce the kind of the kind of citizens we need to navigate this future that we're going into, we need to start seeing education look at humans in a holistic manner of that kind of mind, body, soul, and find ways to nourish each element of that. And I'm not sure that can be 100% done digitally. And also I keep reading Reem's question, Di Marto, and I keep reading it over and over again. And I really also don't really have an answer to that. It will require a huge amount of investment. Um, but education is, it's crucial. We can't move forward without education. So the investments have to be made, right? How can we, it's almost like deciding not to invest in education at this point is also basically saying that we don't want our region to progress into what the 21st century that has actually arrived with this global pandemic. Correct. Just and just to uh, put things in perspective for the rest of the audience, Reem's question is about uh, putting in massive investment in the recruitment and development of teachers, as well as in uh, tech rich environments or those with very little access. So how to keep kids learning is requiring so much of their ability and the teacher's ability to build relationships with parents and families and all stakeholders involved. So thank you for addressing that, Dina. Um, uh, Helen, you had a follow up comment and I can't believe we have three minutes to go. I just want to say um, that we will send, there are some requests coming in for uh, references and resources about the individualized learning method or how to integrate movement and education. So I'll connect with you ladies later and perhaps include them in an email. But I'd love to hear your reflections and maybe turn back to you because you had a couple of uh, points that you both wanted to um, share with the audience as well. So I'll stop with the questions for now. I just wanted to say one thing, which is uh, most of the schools right now, the first term is going to be focused on the well-being and the mental um, mental state of the children. So that should answer whether schools are going to go completely online or not. There is a huge issue in the mental state and well-being of children today. And that is because besides the fact that there was a global pandemic and there was fear and all of that, but the lack of human interaction and the lack of uh, physical space and physical play, a physical space for them to be uh, feel safe, that is something that schools provide, good schools provide. And that is a huge focus for educators in the first term. So that's something that I've been kind of fully engrossed in the last few days. How do you make sure that students are fully caught up? to make sure that the digital, the gaps in learning can be filled, but also the well-being of students first and foremost. You're, you're referring to the well-being that comes from human interaction and the socialization yep. that we get in schools, which goes yep. back to the, the need for physical space. Exactly. You know, a lot of who we are comes from our human interactions, um, who, who we were friends with in school, uh, how we dealt with all of the the different issues that come from being a part of a community at, at school is also a part of your growth as a human. And, um, you know, again, I, I have to say my final comment is we can't escape the fact that digitization is going to enter the education space. I think what we can do is we can, as best as we can, um, all of us, highlight the challenges that need to be solved and where technology can solve, embrace that and where technology can't solve, make that clear. And, you know, we, we need more people to be writing about the space. And I hope that people like Delayla will actually start writing about what, what needs to happen um, with this new convergence of technology entering an education space, what, what needs to happen to continue to tackle things like gender and cultural differences? What needs to happen for us to continue to see what you were talking about, uh, Helen, which is that, that human interaction that is needed for, for young people to maintain a level of well-being, but to also mature um, in their journey into adolescence and then adulthood. That's amazing. I, um, I think that brings us to uh, the end of our session. I'm sorry if we couldn't attend to all questions, but there's so much. This could go on for like another hour at least. Um, 
Thank you so much for your time, Dina and Helen, and for all the valuable information you shared. I had a question come in about the recording. The recording will be shared on She is Arab, as well as Young Arab Leaders um, YouTube channels. Uh, I believe we've learned so much today. We know that it's no longer nice to have anymore. We will be digitizing, we will be moving forward, but the question is to really address the quality of education in the MENA region, to really go down to the, the, the core of like how we deliver the material, what material are we delivering, and to obviously uh, work on furthering collaboration between the public and the private sector and even NGOs and civil society organizations because everybody has a role to play. Uh, innovation is definitely welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Dina. Thank you, Helen. And thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye.